So here is the uh, presentation for the technical architecture overview for Kuali students. Um, you can take questions over Skype. I have that window open. So, uh, the goals of our architecture, uh, separation of concerns, we want the ability to um, separate our components in such a way that institutions could replace them fairly easily and, and with breaking their ability to upgrade uh, to future versions. Uh, we want some deployment flexibility. Uh, one of the issues with implementation of large enterprise systems you need the ability to uh, have some flexibility with your deployment in order to address performance issues and um, reconfigure your deployment in a way that, that makes sense with your changing needs. Be able to consume instead of maintaining middleware. Um, and every time we decide on a new middleware tool, uh, we investigate what middleware open source is available to us uh, and try to find the best fit there. And, and at, the, at the very last, as a very last resort, we'll decide to add additional. We want to be able to support middle, multiple development streams. Uh, we have several parallel teams I'm sure you're aware of uh, where we're building out different aspects of the application. Sometimes there's some overlap, sometimes they're completely separate. The ability to separate those, those development streams without We also need to use patterns where appropriate. Design patterns are, are generally a good idea. You need to use them in um, <coughs> you need to use them judiciously when you're approaching. So we have some history with uh, service-oriented design. We, we do support uh, a large range of services. Um, part of the original Kuali student charter was to adopt and implement SLA methodologies in full. And after a lot of struggling, we realized that this was probably not the most practical approach. Uh, a lot of the stack was not fully implemented. Separation of concerns tended to be too granular and too strict performance and separation of concerns were in constant control. So when we're developing our services, we, we've come up with a classification system. Uh, and this classification system is, is somewhat in flux right now. We're, we're doing some, uh, we, we did an architectural review recently and getting chartered by the foundation to address development velocity issues in Koala students. So our, our class hierarchy, currently we have a class one service, which is our low level. I probably should have put these in order, I guess. Uh, the class one service is really the atomic uh, abstract service where we allow um, persistable entities to be exposed through remotable services. In general, these class one services have a uh, very strict usage pattern. They change very infrequently once they're in use. The impact of change is pretty high because you have to not only change the service contract and update any production systems that are using that contract, but you also have to update the entity structure and ultimately the database structure. Uh, our class two services. These are called compositional services. Uh, they're more along the lines of, of, of business uh, application services. They provide uh, direct integration to the application and separate the application from the entity layer. It gives us the ability to provide adapters for institutions if they, if they determined that a certain business service needed to be replaced, they could actually 
completely replace that, that business service implementation uh, with their, uh, their legacy systems. If they had a legacy system that already did some of the, the work that one of our services was doing, and they don't want to change to entity and database structure, So that's the purpose of the class two service. Um, our data access objects are just interfaces for services to interact with these just different entities. And then at the very lowest level, we have our entities, which are just ORM mapped uh, using JP. So one of the one of the main features of our middleware suite is uh, Kuali Rice. And Kuali Rice is a middleware suite of products that are developed in support of Kuali Foundation products, including student, but also financials, COEUS, and library. And COEUS is research administration. So they're supporting these, these four and actually a couple other side projects as well. Uh, so Rice provides a consolidated roadmap of improvements that are prioritized through the foundational committees specifically the Technical Roadmap Committee and the Application Roadmap Committee. So these committees meet once every other week. And the goal of these meetings is to provide um, prioritization of, of roadmap priorities and uh, to, to guide RICE towards uh, a more usable product outside of the, the within the scope of the, the Kuali Foundation and, and also outside of the scope of the Foundation. RICE also attempts to use the latest open source tools when available uh, to try to avoid reinventing the wheel. Uh, there's been you know, a, a lot of push towards uh, you know, moving away from the non-invented here uh, paradigm and, and, and moving more towards more open source tools, and, and that, that work has gone really well. We're, we're heavily using Spring, jQuery, Apache, including Apache Commons. And whenever a new tool is proposed, uh, research is done to determine if an open source product can already support our needs. And going forward, as we, you know, you may develop a tool and realize, you know, there's, there's, because there's nothing out there available, but then a couple years down the road, there's other open source projects that are coming on as we're, as we're uh, developing. Just time progresses and, and other projects come on that, that we weren't aware of. So we have to keep addressing those, going back and seeing if, if anything uh, can replace some of our, our middleware tools. Uh, we really don't want to support any more than we have to. So in student, our, our rice integration really is constrained to these six items. Uh, the first is KRA, that's our UI framework. And uh, I'm going to go into the details of each of these. Uh, the data dictionary. The data dictionary really has a lot of the, the structure. It, it maintains the structure and uh, data definition for all of our, our entities. Uh, so in, in, a, in the RICE concept, it's a, it's a document management and validation framework. And, and we use it for both of those things. So what do you do with documents? Uh, you can put them through workflow, and, and that's what Q is. Q is our enterprise workflow engine. Um, there are some open source tools out there for doing workflow. They did not meet the initial needs, and, and there's probably going to be um, some more investigation into those, those products coming up soon. But I fully expect that, that Q will continue to be our, our, our workflow tooling for now. Uh, it's, it's a really long-running application. It's been in production for about 10 years. So it's, it's definitely uh, something that's going to be around for a while. Uh, Tim is the identity management system. But right now, it's really just authorization. Uh, there are some uh, authentication components to it. Um, but it is not a full identity management suite. Uh, there's a, a side project uh, to the Quali Foundation called Open Source Identity Management for Higher Ed, which is a consortium of Kuali, uh, JASIG, and 
Internet 2. And those three, those three organizations are working together to build a full suite of identity management tools. And Tim is part of that group or CAS. I mean, there's, there's a whole suite of tools available that we're trying to integrate together into to one system and, and build out the, the gaps that we currently have. Now, the KSB is our service bus. And again, this is, this is one of those components that's probably going to get reviewed again uh, coming up in the near future uh, against uh, the open source community. Most likely we'll be replacing this one. Unlike workflow, this one will likely be replaced. But for now, it is supporting our needs. The final one is the KRMS. This is a rules management system that was developed in-house. Uh, to give you a little background on, on rules management and quality student, we, we began with a very uh, at the very beginning, determining that we really needed a, a, a strong rules management system. We needed the ability for, for users to actually maintain some rules in the system. Certainly not all rules. You, you don't want business users changing application logic everywhere. But you certainly want the ability in certain cases to, to be able to modify rules. So we began the investigation process. We found some open source tools available. We actually tried to implement using rules and ran into some issues that it just didn't support things like backwards chaining, where you try to figure out why a rule failed. Like you, you go down the path and you record every action and every result, and you see exactly what failed. And and, and rules really did not support that kind of uh, that kind of analysis. So we had to change it so fundamentally that we decided that we just weren't going to be able to to extend rules to, to fit our needs. So we had to build our own. So we built our own system. We actually didn't work on the execution environment. We, we started with the, the rules maintenance, where we're capturing and, and maintaining rules, uh, with the thought that we would eventually get to uh, rules execution. And, and lucky enough, the, the Rice team uh, had similar needs. They needed to, to build out rule execution uh, to support Quali Coeus and Coeus actually built their own rules management system as well. So Coeus, Koali Student, and Rice all worked together and designed the KRMS uh, starting about a year and a half ago. And it is up and running in, in Rice 2.0. Uh, and we actually had a, a, a proof of concept. Uh, I don't want to call it that. It was a, it was a, a demonstration of our services uh, at Koali Days in, in November. And we actually executed against uh, the KRMS. Um, so it was exciting to actually see that, that full transition of capturing the rules to, to executing them. Let's talk about KRAD. KRAD, like I said, is our UI framework. It provides integration between the dictionary configuration and jQuery-based rich UI components. So I, I, I talked a little bit about the dictionary. We'll, we'll get into it a little more. but. Um, it's all Spring XML, and, and you configure each element, and you provide a widget for it, and uh, you assign views and uh, create views and, and, uh, and determine which fields map to which element, uh, element fields, and it's uh, very configurable. Uh, so this is based off of a decade of experience with previous UI framework, the previous UI framework, which was called the KNS. So it's really an extension of the KNS to include more rich UI. The KNS was very basic, um, had a lot of um, uh, configuration, but was kind of constrained to uh, simple HTML. Uh, we weren't really doing any kind of JavaScript. Any JavaScript had to be highly customized and tended to break fairly regularly through upgrades. So. The KRAD screens are going to be much more, um, they're designed to be rich UI, so they're, they're going to be much more uh, future proof. It also provides a highly configurable uh, views for maintenance documents, transaction documents, inquiries, and lookup views. Uh, maintenance documents are uh, documents that go through the, the sta uh, a standard workflow process. Um, transactions are really just actions on, a, on an object. So you say, I want to uh, 
change the state of this course to active. That, that kind of thing is, is, would be considered a transaction. Uh, we also, for inquiries, inquiries are just uh, providing a, a read-only view of an object and then look up views or searches against objects. KRED also provides a large library of reusable configurable components for developers who have, and that sentence doesn't make sense. I think that's just, I, I just mistyped that, sorry. So we just have some reusable configurable components. Uh, it allows for a high level of customization through jQuery. Uh, again, w when you get into customization, you do lose some of your uh, stability through upgrades, but the full library of jQuery is way beyond the, our abilities to write customizable components or configurable components for. Uh, but as we introduce new jQuery components, obviously our our configurable components library expands, but um, in the meantime, we have to develop applications, and, and we have needs, and we may have to build out some customized jQuery uh, that eventually goes, gets converted into configurable components as as KRED improves. So there there may be some upgrade issues there. So we try to stay with configurable components as much as possible as we're building applications, but in, in special cases, we may decide to customize. Um, but you can go the full customization route and just completely write your own jQuery components. Um, but again, you, you do lose some of your upgrade stability. So the data dictionary provides document management through spring configuration of maintenance documents and transactional documents, and I spoke briefly about what those are. Uh, let's see if I can get the... The maintenance documents create, update, copy, or inactivate either a single object or a collection of objects. Uh, they're used to perform standard maintenance on data. Uh, this maintenance can include workflow and authorization configuration. Transactional documents, like I said, they just re represent an action that will occur in the system. They're treated as one-shot documents and need not be edited or modified several times because of their approach in performing an action. So it's really just an atomic action in the system. Uh, you fire it off and it, it, it does its action and then it's done. Uh, it also provides a validation configuration framework. Uh, we determine which fields are of which type and we uh, come up with validation criteria. Uh, the, the framework is very flexible. We can add additional types of criteria, not just additional criteria. It has the flexibility of using regex if you need it, but you can also constrain your validation configuration uh, in, your, in, your, in, your di in your dictionary. So you can define new types of validation <coughs> and apply those strongly typed validations against your, your field data. You can also configure default UI components for viewing and editing. Uh, we talked about KRAD a little bit, and, and that's that's how you do it, is, is you provide a, a default mechanism for either viewing or editing a element, whether that's a, a large complex object or a, just a simple field in an object. You can actually customize every component along the way. A queue is our workflow management system. Uh, and it provides document workflow for any object in the data dictionary. We can store, it actually stores objects uh, in the workflow process as XML. This can a actually be overridden to store externally. And so what we can do from the Kuali student side is uh, as an element enters workflow, uh, Q will actually call out and persist the object in our space and then store the, the, the reference object ID in the workflow uh, document process. So instead of storing the whole object uh, 
as XML, we can actually just store the ID in workflow and then reference it from uh, from the, uh, the workflow engine. Just pull the data in from our, our external services. Uh, Q allows for complex routing of rules, uh, or complex routing rules based on derived roles or responsibilities. And I'll get a little more into derived roles and responsibilities when we talk about Kim. Uh, these routing rules are highly configurable. Again, it's, it's XML based. Uh, you provide a, uh, a, a set of nodes um, in, in our workflow process, and those nodes can be bypassed or branched, or um, there's, there's a lot of configurability with, with Q. And, and like I said, it, it's a long running system. Um, Serving two million transactions per year at a couple institutions. Um, Indiana was the originator of Q, and, and, and that's that's our, our source for this two million transactions per year statistic. Um, so routing rules are, like I said, they, they provide the, the actual workflow for how people are requested for approval or given. Uh, Acknowledgement, so they have to acknowledge that they've seen it, or um, they just get an FYI, like here's this document, it's going through the process, and they can either comment on it or, or just. Uh, Kim is our, like I said, our identity management system. And it provides just a fraction of the features that make up an identity management system. Right now, it's just authorization and authentication. And like I said, there's that whole. Open Source Identity Management for Higher Ed uh, Consortium that is uh, working to improve that. Uh, it's designed in conjunction with uh, KS Architects about four years ago. Uh, so the, the initial push to, to get some identity management in RICE was really a, a, a KS initiative. Uh, so we had a lot to do with the initial design. But then moving forward, uh, financials decided they really needed to start using things like um, uh, <coughs> responsibilities and uh, roles. And th that led to <coughs> a, a large scale <laughs> improvement to the, the chem system and, and it really fleshed out the authorization system. So we, we have a, a pretty high functioning authorization system that is in production. Uh, at many institutions. Uh, so let, let's start talking about some of the concepts here. There's, there's role responsibility. Permissions are really just um, you know defining that this person can do this action to this object type. Um, when you get into roles and responsibilities, roles are uh, a person in this position uh, is given these permissions. Uh, they're also given responsibilities. Responsibilities are uh, this, a person in this role must approve documents of this type uh, going through this workflow. So you can actually tie responsibilities to your work workflow routing rules and say um, the director of the department needs to be able to approve needs to approve this document going through this department. So you can you can do routing based on field elements and um, responsibilities. You can also do it based on roles. Um, so there's there's a really complicated authorization system that, that is highly flexible. Uh, it does provide some complexity to the system, right? So you, you don't just get a, a simple system that you can work with that fits your needs. You, you actually have to figure out how to use the system. And, and that's one of the things we're struggling with in, in KS is um, how to best use the system without uh, adding too much complexity. So constraining our use of it to, to be to fit our needs um, without exposing too much complexity. One of the interesting things with Kim is, is derived roles. Derived roles 
uh, can be determined based on uh, remote reference data. So you could actually, in Kin, you can say, I, I want to define this derived role that says, uh, if you're in this class, then you have authorization to um, visit some website. Let's say. So that that reference to the student being in the class is not in the Rice system, it's in the KS system. So when you call into Kim and you check for authorization to visit a website, uh, there may be derived roles that allow someone to visit that website, which would actually call out to the KS remote services. So that's pretty much Kim. Uh, the KSB is our service bus and registry. It allows for live deployment management. You can actually uh, take down or um, change the URL for a service. It allows for uh, uh, configuration uh, of, of the service registries at, at application startup. Um, so we, we do a lot of spring config to, to wire up our our services into the, the service bus, and then we just reference them by our URI, which I talk about in the next bullet here, is that the services are referenced by URIs, which are linked uh, to service URLs and labels. Like I said before, this is a candidate for replacement by open source products, so the Rice team will be investigating that in the, probably the upcoming year or so. Finally, there's the KRMS, the Rules Management System. Uh, provides a UI for collecting business and workflow routing rules from business users. Uh, we're currently in the process. One of the things that we did that, that Coeus didn't do and, and Rice decided not to implement was um, natural language representation. So getting some actual readable text from a rule definition that is readable by a user that's not business savvy. Um, for example, prerequisite rules for courses need to be really explicit, but they also need to be readable. You can't just have, you know, uh, logic strings and special characters to, to represent uh, a, a prerequisite rule. You actually need some, some English text. So one of the things we did in KS is we also determined that this natural language needs to change based on your context. So you may want something more concise for a catalog than you would have in your um, in your scheduled classes. Your scheduled classes may be more, more uh, detailed, or it, it might be the vice vice versa. The, the catalog may be the, the more verbose and the, the schedule classes may be more uh, concise. Uh, we also do strongly type propositions and, and propositions are really just uh, a piece of a rule tree. It's the, the atomic uh, comparison that happens. Uh, for example, uh, student must have completed English 101 would be a, a, a proposition. That, that proposition could be used in a, a large tree of rules, and, and you can execute that tree and, and come back with a, a single result that, yes, this person can enroll in this course. Uh, so you, you can set up complex logic and place the propositions in this complex tree, but the, these strongly typed propositions constrain which proposition types are available given a context. So if we're talking about prerequisite rules, we want to be able to only select prerequisite rules. We don't want the full uh, catalog of proposition types to pull from because they're probably not relevant to that context. So we've done uh, much more strong type propositions than the KMS has. So we're actually working to, to resolve this uh, by making some improvements to the KMS to include uh, natural language representation and strong type propositions. There, the KMS has a term resolver framework which allows for multiple avenues for retrieving data that is used to evaluate rules. And um, these are just method calls. It's you know resolve this term, and, and given a term type, uh, it, it knows given some parameters how to how to source that information. Uh, 
Um, so you just have, you could have multiple term resolvers for the same type, and it can figure out the best path, and, and you can actually associate metrics with those paths, either hard coding them up front, or um, at some point we, we might investigate doing real-time analysis, but again, that's, that's way down the road and probably not a good idea in general, but there, there is the option there for, for doing some uh, evaluation of, of, of best path to retrieving all the data needed to execute a rule. We use Spring pretty heavily in KS and in Rice. Uh, we use dependency injection a lot. Pretty much most of our application configuration is all dependency injection. Data dictionary is completely spring based. Uh, it does validation configuration, UI configuration, and workflow configuration. The application context, like I mentioned, uh, is all dependency injection. Test framework and context is spring based. Uh, we use Spring MVC and KRAD. And uh, we use a little bit of AOP uh, in the service layering but uh, it's pretty judicious for not overdoing it. <coughs> some of the, the patterns we use are, are skip that for now. some of the patterns we use are parent bean, decorator, builder, factory, there's a few others, but uh, try to stick to some basics. For our deployments, uh, our current deployment, the supported deployment configurations, we, we have two configurations right now. The first is with a single application server with a single database schema. Um, you can actually split up that schema if you really wanted to uh, across multiple database servers, um, but it would be a manual process at this point. Uh, the other configuration we have is where you have a Rice server uh, and a KS server, and they each have their own schema. And again, you could split up the KS schema a little more, but it, again, it would be a manual process. So that, we also have done some horizontal scaling, and some of the implementers have done some horizontal scaling using sticky sessions with load balancing. And uh, we haven't done very many tests on on that. We have seen some uh, unofficial improvements. Uh, the load seems to be less effective at uh, slowing the system down. Um, some of the proposed deployments we want to support are, are a little more complex, where we're actually splitting up the, the KS servers. Yeah, and Rajiv, as Rajiv mentioned, he has a couple of pictures that I can visualize and, and I can do uh, that afterwards. Um, so we're, we're actually looking to split up each of the, the major components of KS. Um, and, and have them deployable on their own servers with their own schemas. And then we want we also want to w investigate horizontal scaling using clustered sessions. This is one of those things where you know uh, a lot of a lot of projects tend to go a little too far down the road before they they uh, investigate clustered sessions. And it's one of those things that's difficult to tack on. Uh, and we're approaching that that too far down the road path. Uh, we're, we're getting close to it becoming difficult, if not impossible, to <coughs> introduce clustered sessions without massive work. So we really need to, to push for this. And uh, if we decide we're going to do it, then we need to start implementing it now. So here's the, the basic stack of, of how our application runs. Uh, we have database tables, obviously, which are designed by DBA. So this is part of the work of the DBAs is to take some of the initial entity designs from the, the service team. The service team, you know, they come up with a basic service design, then they come up with um, the, the entity design, and, and that kind of informs the DBAs how, how they should build out the, the database structure. So then once that database structure is fully defined, then we build an entity to match that database. And that's just a JPA hybrid or mapping. Uh, 
Then we have assemblers, which actually map those entities to DTOs and vice versa back from the DTOs to entities. I think that's actually incorrect. It should be DAOs. So it, it, it maps entities to DAOs and, and DAOs to entities, and then the service takes the DAOs and maps them to DTOs. And so DTOs are just Jack's D elements. I just missed a layer in here. And uh, so each service provides ops on one or more DTOs. So for example, uh, we have the course service. So there's multiple DTOs within the course service. There's the, the course info. There's um, learning objective info. There, there, there's all these different info objects that are managed by that service. And, and the service is really meant to provide operations on the set of DTOs that make sense for that, that area of interest, that business area. Uh, on top of the services, we have some decorators, service decorators. Right now, I think we're limited to authorization and validation, but we could add additional layers if we wanted to. Uh, this allows us to plug in authorization or validation on any service method without actually changing the, uh, the contract or even the implementation. So we can, as an institution, you could actually apply additional layers on top of your service to, to do additional checking or uh, logging. Or, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of decorators you could add to your services. Once you get into the actual application, then you start talking about controllers. So the, the controllers just provide a UI, provide the UI with an interface to the services. Uh, on top of the controllers, you have view helpers, which actually provide KRAD views with operations that don't interact with services. They actually interact directly with the model that the application is going to use. So the controllers provide the application model. The view helpers interact with that model. Uh, as the application is running without actually having to access the services. Um, one of the things we're in the process of changing is our project structure. Um, when we first started, we, d we decided that we were going to do Maven submodules. So we have a Maven project, and under it we have uh, some major modules like KS Core, KS Common, they're all listed here. And under each of those, Maven modules, there are sub-modules. Uh, for example, KS Core API, KS Core Impl. Um, so we have a lot of Maven projects, a lot of Maven modules that are hierarchical in nature. And, uh, this produced some complexity. Uh, the service contract changes through the course of development created some pretty substantial instability. Uh, separating streams of work. Uh, we didn't have the flexibility of adopting changes at a different pace. So two teams are working on similar pieces of code that are depending on service changes. One team may need the service changes, and the other team um, may, it may be too risky to pull in those service changes right away. So we, we need the ability to adopt changes at different paces for different streams of work. And that was really difficult with that structure. Um, it was difficult also just to pull a small section of the code base and work in that. It, it, there tended to be a lot of interdependencies. Um, uh, we late, I guess early last year, uh, we started noticing, well, two years ago, I guess, we started noticing some problems with Eclipse support of this Maven module hierarchy. <coughs> There's major performance issues, and uh, we actually had some stability problems where the build would just break randomly, and it was really difficult to fix. Uh, and it really came down to Eclipse not so the Eclipse Maven plugins not really supporting uh, that structure fully. So we had to switch to IntelliJ, and that's why we're currently using IntelliJ as our uh, IDE of choice. Um, the old structure also wouldn't allow for uh, separate release schedules for components. So uh, curriculum management is out the door. It's in production right now. Uh, a 
And if we needed to, to do a pass release of that, um, we couldn't do it in our, in, our, in our main branch. We have to completely branch everything every time we want to do these uh, separate releases. And um, it creates a lot of confusion and it creates a lot of problems with merging those changes back. And those version numbers had to match across all the modules. So you'd have to version everything all at once. And it just didn't make sense uh, for what we were hoping to accomplish. So the new structure, we have separate projects uh, with separate versions. Uh, so each of these components is actually going to be an individual project. Uh, it'll have its own submodules. And, and there may be some hierarchy to those modules, but it's going to be a lot less complex and a lot less um, difficult for IDEs to actually work with them. The, the uh, memory constraints are going to be a lot better. So first we have services, and this is just the contracts and implementations. And uh, going forward, uh, that's going to be version 2.0. Uh, then we have KS Core, which is our core applications, our abstract classes, our test framework, tooling, security, a couple other things. Let me um, go back, and I'll show you which, which things are pulling in here. So for KS services, it's pulling from core common for the abstract service classes. Uh, it's pulling from LUM, which is Learning Unit Management, which has tentatively been renamed Curriculum Management. Pulling services from enrollment. So that's that's the base components for KS services. For KS Core, it's the remainder of Core and Common. So all of the, uh, the actual applications based on those core services. It's the test framework, it's tooling, it's abstract classes that aren't service-based. Uh, it's security. And I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Uh, curriculum management <coughs> is going to be everything in curriculum management except for the services. So, and again, that's going to, all of these are going to be version 2.0 except for enrollment. And you'll see enrollment is at version 1.0 because there was no previous version of enrollment. So there's no point in calling it 2.0 because there was no 1.0. Then we get into this separate streams of work and disparate versioning and, and trying to keep everything in one project just does not support that. Uh, finally, we have KS Web, which is our deployments. And uh, again, we, we currently are doing uh, those two deployments I talked about earlier. And eventually, we're going to be expanding that out to additional deployments. Finally, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the config database, uh, the database extract. Um, currently, yeah, so Reggie's asking what the CM version is. Currently, CM is at version 1.21 1 .1 is the latest release, and 1.2.2 is coming out soon. Um, but as curriculum management is upgraded, um, we're also going to have version 2.0 and probably keep a separate branch uh, for 1.2 just for patch releases because it is a production system so we do have to support it. Um, but uh, ideally that 1.2 or 1.x will actually be sunset as we have uh, some service contract changes uh, from the 2.0 service contracts that we're going to need to pull in. So Moving forward, we're, we're hoping to, to convert all of the production systems to, to curriculum management 2.0. So moving on to the databases. Uh, the, the databases are a little confusing right now. We need to come up with a, a, a better structure for managing them. But uh, we, we do have a process, and it is a little cumbersome, and it does provide for some confusion. Basically, what you do is you, <coughs> you write initial DB and uh, reference data scripts for, for new entity types. And so those scripts are, are pulled nightly, or actually on commit, it actually checks to see if there are any changes to any of the, the database scripts. And it actually runs those scripts against an Oracle database, and then we're using a tool written by the Rice team to do database extracts. And we're aware that 
there are lots of open source tools available that do the same thing and probably do it better. Um, but it is the process we have in place right now, and we're working to replace that with local base. But for now, we're, we're using a, a product from Rice called Impex, and we're, we're working to replace that. Um, so after you create your reference data, and after that data is in use, uh, either across multiple teams and, and um, or in production, and then that's really the, the line you draw is, is once once data is in production and, and an institution may add or remove data from that reference data, then you need to start writing upgrade scripts. So anytime you make changes to your database structure, you have to alter tables or uh, transition data from one table to another. Uh, you can replace tables with, with new tables, uh, but you have to transition the data through that process. You can't just drop data. So we have to write upgrade scripts in those cases where there is production data. Uh, there, may all be, there may also be cases during development where a team uh, puts in place some reference data that uh, isn't easily transitioned to the new structure, and that becomes a difficult process. And, and so instead of replacing all the reference structure and, and reference data, uh, you actually have to, to provide upgrade scripts for that data, even though it's not in production. So there may be a case for that as well. So you write these upgrade scripts and the, the initial DB scripts, and they all get run against your, uh, your Oracle server, and then it extracts those out into XML files, which from your development stand, a developer standpoint, you actually just check out the, the, the project, and you run a Maven script, and it actually loads your Oracle database or your MySQL database with uh, that XML data. So that's pretty much all I had. Does anybody have any questions? The uh, Mesba asked a question. Um, is a proposition a rule? Yes. <laughs> so a proposition is part of a rule. Uh, it could be the entire contents of a rule. Um, a rule is really just a container of propositions. So a proposition, there's, there's lots of proposition types. Some of them can just be, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, there's a certain proposition type that allows you to build a hierarchy of propositions. So it, it's a proposition that contains other propositions. For example, you could have, uh, and I'll write it in the chat so it gets recorded. So uh, proposition one is actually proposition two and Proposition three. So each proposition can actually be a, um, a combination of, of a hierarchy of propositions underneath it. So in proposition two could also be a combination of, of of propositions. But then when you get down, let's say proposition three equals student must have completed English one hundred and one. So that's really the atomic rule that says you must have completed something. And then you can combine these into a hierarchy which reside within a rule. And rules can either have um, actions associated with them or just a, an outcome that says this is the result of the rule. Um, in general, in, so far in KS, most of our, our rule execution has been around um, just getting a result back, you know, a yes or no answer to a question, can this student enroll in this course? Um, but moving forward, we're going to be uh, using some of the more complicated concepts within KRMS, like, um, you know, 
which action should we take based on the, 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 this rule? And so uh, the rule will actually fire off that action. Yes, go ahead and take over. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to show a couple of pictures to visualize the, some of the things that you talked about there. And these are really off the onboarding page that Cheryl and I put together with the content that came from many folks, including you, Larry. Which actually reminds me that, Larry, um, we should get your PowerPoint that you just presented and merge the material in here and what we already have on the onboarding site. But what we have on the site has a couple of pictures that I did want us to just quickly look at. This is the first one. Um, and so this is the deployment architecture uh, topology that you were talking about earlier, between standalone and embedded. This one shows both. I don't know if you want to say anything about this, then. Yeah. So one of the one of the confusing parts about the the deployment topology between Rice and Chaos is um, Rice actually changed their uh, vocabulary around their deployments after we already created our structure and we haven't updated it yet. So in, in this case, um, their concept of standalone, um, they're, 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 they're really thinking more along the lines of an application built within Rice. Uh, and not so much an application built outside of Rice that is using Rice. So this embedded client really for KS standalone uh, application. So this has an embedded queue client that talks to the standalone Rice server. And our embedded deployment actually has everything on one application server. So the, the Rice server and the uh, the, the KS application are both in the same ADS. And, and even for embedder, sometimes we have the same database schema for both, although it could be two separate schemas. What was that? Is that the database schemas are separate or are they the same for embedder? Uh, they can be the same or they can be separate in, in, in embedded mode. Um, right now, if you just run embedded as is, they'll be in the same schema. But you actually have to define separate data sources for each. So they actually have different data sources. But you can also combine those data sources. The other picture I wanted to just bring forward is the picture of Kim. And I think you'll see this more with Eric next week. The bottom line, this shows the services on the Kim side, um, on the Kim server side as well as the client side. So take a look at this page when you, when you have some time to find it. A couple more. Let's jump to the presentation UI page and we'll pop a link in the chat. Um, so, Larry, I think you talked about the fact that CM used GWT, whereas enrollment uses KRAD. I actually did not talk about that, but okay, that so is correct. Right. So, curriculum management uses GWT, and it will be converted over to KRAD at some point in time. But for now, it uses GWT. And the UI framework that is used under the covers uh, which is, which I, I sometimes, I think we refer to it as a UI app. Uh, the flow, the object flow looks like that. With the client uh, making calls to the GWT servlet, and the GWT servlet under the covers um, calling services on the KSB, the race as well as the KS services hosted on the KSB. So this shows a very simplistic version of that. Then there's another one. Go ahead. I'll go back to that other one when we talk about that a little bit. Okay. Um, 
one thing to note here is is this quality service bus in the middle here. Um, this is not one application server that is distributing these requests. What happens is each each application server actually has uh, an embedded uh, plugin for the quality service bus. And if a call goes out to that service bus that is actually located on that server, it, it contains the request in the same JDF. So it doesn't actually do a remote call, even though it's, it's it, it, from the application perspective, it doesn't know if it's remote or not. It just calls to the service bus and says, get me the handle to this service, and it may be the same JDF. So it'll just call the JDF. In the case where it's actually remotable, it'll actually go through the, the central uh, repository and route you. The other one is a little more in-depth, uh, higher level. I wouldn't even call this an object model. This is just showing the different layers where the browser is caught. In this case, uh, this is an example of a course proposal uh, being processed uh, in CM. So in this case, it's showing that the browser on the submit is calling the course proposal uh, on PC GWP server, which, um, and maybe you can explain this better than I can, maybe. Uh, there are filters being applied. Well, I think this has changed now. The filters are now at the service layer, not at the ser a GWP server layer. Right, so the, some of that we're handling through the decorators, the service decorators, um, and some of it we're we're probably going to have to create additional services for. So this this workflow filter, the proposal workflow filter, for example, um, this could actually be deployed as a. Uh, a so this this. Transformation data, and it's basically the controller for the GWP. I was losing your audio for a few seconds there. Um, and this is another picture of um, a deployment. Just showing the hybrid location to this. I think I have a picture somewhere of the Kirad. UI. Ah, there it is. This may have changed in the last few months. This is an early version of the clear ad architecture. So if you look at that, you will see more or less a standard spring MVC flow happening in the coach. But there are some terms that are rice specific terms that are being used here. And by the way, you can talk about those, like lookupable and acquireable and maintainable. Yeah, there's not a whole lot. Okay. And it, it really covers a lot of the. I'm supposed to talk about like about the lookupable and viable and the maintenance. 